You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. India's T.S. Tirumurthy assumes new chair of UN Counter-Terrorism Committee. Pakistan trying to revive Khalistan movement. And Taliban imposing rigid laws of their past rule. India is not only concerned about the safety and security of people living in its own territory, but it always reiterates adopting and executing improved strategies to counter terrorism globally. Recently, T.S. Surumurthy, India's permanent representative to the UN, assumed the chair of the Security Council Counter Terrorism Committee for 2022. As the chair for CTC, New Delhi will make determined efforts to ensure that global response to the threat of terrorism remains effective. A report. Over the past several years, across different platforms, India has made sure that it does voice its concerns when it comes to counter-terrorism. The world recognizes India's efforts and hence last year, New Delhi was asked to chair three important committees of the Security Council, which include the Taliban Sanctions Committee, Counter-Terrorism Committee and the Libyan Sanctions Committee. India has recently assumed the chair of Counter-Terrorism Committee for 2022. This committee was formed in September 2001, soon after the tragic terrorist attack of 9-11 in New York. India is chairing this key subsidiary body of the UNSC after a long gap of 10 years. The last time New Delhi held the chairmanship of the CTC was in the year 2011 and 2012. The Counter-Terrorism Committee comprises all 15 members of the Security Council, including India, France, Russia, United Kingdom, United States, China, among others. When terrorism is expanding its tentacles to new areas, Security Council needs to act without delay. And India has now got an opportunity to work closely with all member states to address the issue. Fortunately, India is at the UN Security Council this time and has assumed the chair of the, uh, G, uh, the CTC and has been consistently working on it, whether it is in the context of global terrorism through its comprehensive convention on international terrorism or through uh, focusing that how to define, as Prime Minister Modi himself had said, that the terrorism has not even been defined properly by the, uh, by the United Nations let alone fight it. So there are definitely uh, interests, there are definitely countries even among the P5 uh, which tend to use their geopolitical objectives over the global objectives of fighting terrorism. Uh, India has always singled out that there cannot be a good terrorist, bad terrorist, my terrorist or your terrorist. And that is something that is extremely important to remember. On the eve of assuming chair of the CTC, India had voted in favor of a resolution to renew the mandate of the Counter-Terrorism Committee Executive Directorate. The UN Security Council, through its written silence procedure, renewed the mandate of the Executive Directorate until December 31, 2025. The Counter-Terrorism Committee is assisted by the Executive Directorate, which carries out its policy decisions and conducts expert assessments of the 193 United Nations member states. In its explanation of the vote, India has reiterated it is committed to pursue all the necessary measures in collaboration with other member states towards the goal of zero tolerance for terrorism. The country will make determined efforts to further enhance the role of CTC in strengthening the multilateral response to counter-terrorism. More importantly, New Delhi will ensure that the global response to the threat of terrorism remains unambiguous, undivided and effective. 
the South Asian nation has called on member states to remain united against the tendency of labeling acts of terrorism based on its motivation. It believes such categorization will lead the global community back to the pre-9-11 era of my terrorist versus your terrorist. Despite the differences, India has successfully shown it as it was seen in the June 7th GSTC meeting. Uh, India has uh, stood by it and the consensus has been obtained. And similarly, when uh, the Security Council Resolution 2593 uh, with regard to Afghanistan was there at that time, terrorism coming out of, emanating out of Afghanistan in a very uh, fluid situation has been a major concern and India has focused on it very clearly. It has very clearly articulated its views and it has taken on board all sides. So I have no doubt that India will make a great contribution to this fight, but at the same time, uh, the international geopolitics will continue to play its role. The chairing of the Counter-Terrorism Committee has a special resonance for India, which has not only been at the forefront of fighting terrorism, especially cross-border terrorism, but has also been one of its biggest victims. Chairing this committee is a ringing endorsement of the country's leadership in the fight against terrorism. It will help keep the focus on the presence of terrorists and their sponsors threatening the peace in the South Asian region and beyond. Let's move to Jammu and Kashmir where the security forces have launched a series of counter-terrorism operations to demolish the cow web of Pakistan-aided terrorism in the region. Pakistan is trying hard to whip up havoc and violence through continuous terror attacks and infiltration bits in Kashmir. However, the alert Indian security forces are eliminating these terrorists with a commitment to maintaining peace and tranquility in the region. We have a report. The Indian security forces are carrying out a series of operations to uproot the network of terrorism from Jammu and Kashmir. The terror groups operating in the valley have received a huge setback. Recently, three Jaish-e Mohammed militants, including a Pakistani national, were killed in an encounter with the security forces in the Pulwama district in Jammu and Kashmir. The security forces launched a cordon and search operation after specific inputs about the presence of terrorists in the area. Meanwhile, security forces also gunned down a militant affiliated with the Pakistan-based Lashkar-e-Taiba outfit during an encounter in Srinagar city of the region. Today, the Srinagar police had an input developed in the Salimar Bagh. एल टी का जो कमांडर है सलीम परे 2016 से एक्टिव है वो अपने एक एफटी साथी के साथ घूम रहा है श्रीनगर पुलिस वहाँ पर गई उसके बाद सीआरपी भी आ गई कॉर्डन डाले कॉर्डन डालते ही फायरिंग शुरू हो गया जिसमें सलीम परे मौके पर मारा गया एफटी वहाँ से भागने में कामयाब हो गया है हम लोग उसको फॉलो करते रहे और जाके गुसू में दूसरा ब्रिज में उसको हम लोग कॉर्डन डाले फिर आर्मी भी ज्वाइन कर ली फिर दूसरा इनकाउंटर में आर्मी सी पुलिस मिल दूसरा एफ को भी न्यूट्राइज कर लिया as Kashmir is heading towards more peace and prosperity, Pakistan, being envious of its development, is busy hatching woolly plots to incite terrorism in the valley. Just a few days back, India's border security force recovered a huge haul of arms, ammunition and heroin near the border district of Samba in Jammu and Kashmir. The recovery was made based on inputs received by the border forces that found the arms, ammunition and contraband drugs hidden in bushes and a white sack. We were getting a lot of input in the past few years that in the past few years, there was a lot of arms, ammunition, arms, ammunition or narcotics. We were trying to do it for that. तो उसके मद्देनजर हमने अपनी जो सतर्कता बढ़ाई हुई थी और हम पूरी तरह से तैनात थे और ये जो प्रयास किया गया था हमारी ट्रुप्स की तैनाती की वजह से ये विफल हुआ है 
और ये बहुत अच्छी रिकवरी बी ने की है और एक आगे बड़ी ट्रेजडी हो सकती थी इनका इस्तेमाल करके उसको रोका गया है On one hand Pakistan is refusing to change its modest operandi and on the other hand the notorious South Asian country is inviting India to the SAAF meeting. Islamabad's desire for a summit doesn't sit well with its recent attempt at infiltration into JNK. Moreover, India's neighbor rediscovered enthusiasm for holding a SAAF summit in Islamabad is likely aimed at shoehorning the Taliban as the representative of Afghanistan. Pakistan sometimes makes a lot of humor i would say on the one hand they are not ready to accept whatever terrorists they are infiltrating into india and recently what happened in karen sector where a bat uh, man was bat uh, team wa man was killed and also in the international border area of arnia where another infiltrator was killed they refuse to accept their bodies and refuse to accept them as their people from there and the on the other hand they want india to come and participate in sark sark was actually made for the cooperation between all these countries and pakistan is the biggest impediment in this sark movement because pakistan is not stopping its in infiltration it's not stopping its terrorism exporting it to india and other countries also and therefore india would be better off than rather attending sark Instead of holding a SAAC meeting which is unlikely to yield any meaningful outcome, Pakistan should rather focus on addressing India's concern on countering terrorism. Otherwise, New Delhi on its side has many other options to tackle the nefarious agendas of Islamabad. Since returning to power in August, the Taliban have increasingly imposed their harsh interpretation of Islamic law. severely curtailing freedoms particularly those of women and girls many afghans particularly women who hoped the taliban would reform their extreme views have been disappointed by the new severe restrictions imposed on them a report the level of backwardness and barbarism of taliban is astonishing massacring common afghan people for over the past two decades was not enough for them as they are now beheading mannequins this video in the public domain is from herat where the taliban authorities have asked clothing shops to behead all female mannequins calling them un-islamic under the taliban's strict interpretation of islamic law depictions of the human figure are forbidden and it is more difficult for them to tolerate these figures which represent women In the war-torn country, women particularly are facing the brunt as they are slowly being squeezed out of public life. A majority of secondary schools remain shut for them, while most women have been banned from working. However, Taliban spokesmen claim that women are not being denied their rights in the Islamic Emirate. Uh, in Afghanistan from uh, primary all the way to university levels, Uh, all women uh, are allowed to attend school and attain education on a uh, public sector uh, from grade 1 to 6 all girls are attending school and in a conservative society like Afghanistan that comprises majority uh, of female students uh, and we have uh, up to 12 to 13 provinces where where uh, girls are attending from grade 7 all the way to 12 and uh, the government uh, the state policy is that uh, we will give every right to to the female members of our society that comprise half the population uh, their right to work their right to education and every single other right uh, that has been afforded to them uh, uh, in the uh, in islam the taliban seized power in afghanistan in mid august and since then the radical group has been imposing harsh restrictions after the take over The de facto rulers in Kabul immediately instructed girls and young women to stay home. The anger of Afghan women is being reflected in their periodic demonstrations against the Taliban. Those who expected a positive transformation of the Taliban mindset were wrong 
because there is absolutely no indication of their flexibility and tolerance as far as their approach on societal issues is concerned. On the other hand, Taliban is claiming that their government represents the common people of Afghanistan who are fully satisfied with the ruling dispensation. To call it, term it as a, a Taliban government is uh, incorrect. This is the government, uh, a representative government of the people of Afghanistan. It did not come uh, here through uh, in an airplane. It was not airdropped. The leadership was not airdropped. It was not backed by foreign forces. It is the people of Afghanistan that this new government represents. And for the world, it is absolutely necessary. It is imperative uh, to engage uh, with this new government and accept the unique the uniquity uh, of the Afghan people for what it is and uh, engage with it in dialogue. If there are any outstanding issues, uh, it can all be uh, resolved through dialogue and engagement. Using pressure tactics uh, is, not, is not the answer to, uh, to the problems that Afghanistan is facing. The Taliban regime has failed to earn recognition from any UN member state because of their rigid an intransigent mode of governance, their inability to transform their mindset on issues such as women's freedom. Their argument that the US refusal to release its frozen assets is the reason for them not being able to reopen girls schools and universities is illogical. It is the human and not the financial resources which are essential for reopening doors for female education. Taliban government should understand that a country can't survive in the 21st century by pursuing a retrogressive and ultra-conservative approach. The eventual outcome of suppressing the freedom and creativity of women will be the erosion of Afghan society. Banning music, songs and healthy entertainment avenues will augment frustration, anger and antagonism, particularly among the youth. In turn, the wrong message will be delivered to the world that the Afghan people are socially backward and can never live a normal life. Pakistan has always tried to revive the issue of Khalistan, a separatist movement that is long dead. Through various means and strategies, Islamabad tries to instigate Sikh youth in India and abroad with the objective of spoiling their future. However, the movement has gotten nowhere despite Pakistani support. Take a look. The support for Khalistan in India has sunk very low, but the militant groups like the Khalistan Liberation Force and Six for Justice have been pushing their agenda hard through various platforms with the help of the Pakistan's ISI. Notorious ISI is making every possible attempt to bolster Khalistan groups in different countries across the globe. Park backed Khalistan ideologue Gurpant Vant Singh Panno of Band Outfit Six for Justice is continuously attempting to disturb Punjab's peace, stability, and communal harmony. He often uploads incendiary videos to his YouTube channel in order to incite Sikhs in Punjab to oppose India. Recently, Panu released yet another video in which he threatened Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and tried to instigate common youth. The pro Khalistan agenda for a separate homeland has no takers in Punjab. But the cause still survives in Pakistan, where jihadist groups have made common cause with Sikh separatists like Panu against their shared enemy, India. After the creation of Pakistan after 1947, there were so many sacred places of Sikhs in Pakistan. The sacred places of Sikhs are called Gurdwara Sahib. Uh, the three most sacred places of Sikhs still are in Pakistan. Nankana Sahib, the birthplace of Sikh uh, religion's uh, uh, creator. Kartarpur Sahib. Panja Sahib. Now those who want to create Khalistan, a separate Sikh state, they ignore these three, three sacred places of Sikhs which are in Pakistan, which shows their intention that they are fulfilling Pakistan's agenda. 
Islamabad's role in supporting the Khalistan movement is a direct consequence of 1971 breakup of Pakistan. When Bangladesh was formed out of East Pakistan with the help of the Indian Armed Forces. Following 1971 war, the only thing Pakistan wanted was revenge and more specifically bleeding India with a thousand cuts. Thus, post-1971, Pakistan's policies and strategical measures underwent transition and became entirely dedicated to hurt India along with the religious, political and ethnic lines. In this way, the foundation of the Khalistan movement was laid. The ethnic cleansing, forced conversions, targeted attacks on the Gurdwaras have reduced the Sikhs, Hindus and Christians into a small fraction of community in Pakistan. Yet Pakistan assumes to be the champion of the Khalistani causes and support the Khalistan militancy. General Yahya Khan and Bhutto wanted to create many separate states within India. Bhutto once said, and I quote, once the back of Indian forces is broken in the east, Pakistan should occupy the whole of eastern India and make it a permanent part of East Pakistan. Kashmir should be taken at any price, even the Sikh Punjab and turn in it into Khalistan. Unquote. Bhutto was hanged by another military dictator, General Zia. And General Zia, who succeeded Bhutto as the head of a state, he continued that policy. The new generation in Punjab has totally rejected Pakistan's malicious propaganda and has opposed any such move that divides people along lines of faith. Hence, Islamabad should now understand that it cannot achieve its goal of forming a separate Khalistan either through conventional war or through other conspiracies. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsaanin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.